been 63 years since the plump and sassy star of Josef von Sternberg's The Blue Angel traveled from Berlin to Hollywood and began molding herself into Dietrich, the legend, who could make love to half the men and women in Hollywood and still be there for her little daughter, too. Or so we thought. That daughter, Maria Riva, has now written a book about her mother's allure, self-absorption, and careless cruelties. But also about the way her whole family was forced to serve the legend, right to the empty and heartbreaking end. Now lots of men stand six foot seven, and lots of men have arms like heaven, and lots of men have hair all golden and wavy. Dietrich. In the 1930s and 40s, no one had ever seen anything like her before. A woman so tough. What are you waiting for? So direct. I kissed you because I loved you. For a minute. So androgynous. All sex, one writer said, and no gender. A glamour girl who lived like one of the boys. Who's buying me a drink? And nothing on screen was accidental. Dietrich was deliberately creating a legend, supervising every sequin, every feather, every shadow on her face. And off screen, too. These are Dietrich's home movies shown here for the first time. A chronicle of life with her at the absolute center. Basil Rathbone drops over for a little badminton. David Niven in for a chat. Jack Kennedy on the beach. Every frame a tribute to Dietrich's perfection as pinup as housefrau, as adoring mother. And by her side, a young girl who would spend a lifetime as witness to her mother's power. You cannot judge Dietrich on any normal scale in the world. If you try to understand Dietrich on a normal basis, you'll never get there. At age 68, less than a year after her mother's death, Maria Riva has written an astounding tale of her mother's life, including her rapacious appetite for admiration and her endless lovers. What were you thinking of? Well, if you keep looking at me like that, I'm liable to tell you. What? John Wayne was one of the few who turned Dietrich down, saying he didn't oh, want to be part of the world. stable, which what numbered in the hundreds. Michael Wilding? Michael Rennie, Harry Cohn, Edward R. Murrow, Piaf, Adlai Stevenson, Sam Spiegel, Frank Sinatra, Harold Arlen, Kirk Douglas, and an impressive array of ladies and gentlemen who must remain nameless. And everybody was happy. After a night of love, her mother would give Maria the review. Sinatra? We never heard anything about Sinatra except one word. He is tender. And then sweet. Sweet and tender was uh, Frankie. Eddie Fisher. She said, now I understand why Elizabeth Taylor had to go with Burton. What do you call this? I mean, she was God's gift to men and women. That's what you call it. May I have this? Of course. <laughs> was she a lesbian? I don't think my mother would think of herself as a lesbian, no. But she loved women. A lot of them Hollywood actresses. This, a millionaire she called my pirate. She told Maria women were better lovers. You just couldn't live with them. If my mother's appetites had been generated by sexual desire, I would have been disgusted by it and I would have pulled away in a different way. But basically, my mother did not like sex, you see. And so you did it as fast as possible to get it over with. But when I kiss, they want some more. And wanting more becomes a bore. She never thought sexually, only romantically. And this was Dietrich's idea of romance. A canoe ride with her lover, blindingly handsome Douglas Fairbanks Jr. And an audience, Maria and her father. Dietrich's husband for 53 years, Rudolf Sieber. And you and your father are witness yeah. to all of this. Oh, sure. Right? It was a happy family. How can you explain to the outside world I know, a marriage it difficult? in which the woman sends her husband love letters that she's writing other yeah. men to get his approval, mm -hmm. writing him that how disappointed she is that she didn't turn out to be pregnant when she thought she was by another man? If you adored her, you took whatever she had to give you, the crumbs. You're talking about worshippers. Yeah. 
Uh-huh. That's what I'm talking about, sweetheart. And one of the worshippers, Maria, who even as a little girl was her mother's collaborator, confidant, and maid. Waiting for her to undress her and put away the shoes. They have to be cooled first, you know. You can't put shoes away when they're warm. But it wasn't uh, Cinderella. This was my world, and I loved it. I thought it was fascinating. I was never bored. But for all the showy public hugging, Reva says her mother initiated it. That was the rule. You didn't touch my mother. You didn't sit on her bed with her? Oh, no, no, no. Nobody was allowed to sit on her bed, except uh, special gentlemen. My mother was royalty. We have some of the home movies. You were playing with other kids? No. These were children that were brought in to have autographs from my mother. I never went to school. I never had friends. She never wanted me to be away from her side. Did it feel like love, this need to have you there with her all the time? When you see your parent have the same euphoric love and tenderness uh, for a loaf of bread, or a song, or a man, or a woman, as they have for you, you step back and start not to trust it. And in fact, in truth? I don't think my mother knew what love was. And that was her tragedy. Maria says there was one loving adult in her childhood, her father's mistress, Tommy. I loved her. She was a vulnerable creature. And between them, they destroyed her. Tommy served Dietrich's purposes, cooking, cleaning, the extra woman when Dietrich and Rudy entertained Dietrich's lovers. But Tommy's affair with Rudy was not going to get in Dietrich's way. What did they do to her? She allowed them to force her into more than 15 abortions. And they made her feel that it was her fault to have become pregnant in the first place. When Tommy got depressed, Dietrich got her hooked on drugs. When Tommy became suicidal, Maria was forced to take and watch as she got electric shock treatments. Tommy died in an asylum. I feel I have the right to blame them for that. There, I judge. And when I judge, I judge. Reva also judges for something that happened when she was 15 and started becoming interested in boys. Her mother moved her into a separate apartment to live with the secretary of one of Dietrich's friends, someone whose sexual aggressiveness was well known. I was raped when I was a young girl. Who raped you? Uh, the uh, woman uh, who was the secretary of one of my mother's lovers. Reva is convinced that her mother wanted to initiate her with women, in part to keep her from leaving with a man. You think she should have known? If you lock an alcoholic in a liquor store and he helps himself to the bottles of liquor, who do you blame? The person that takes the alcohol that's offered or the person who locked him in the liquor store? How long did it go on? About uh, a year and a half. Did you ever tell her? No. I wouldn't give her that satisfaction. Power must not be allowed to triumph all the time. It mustn't be forgiven no matter what it does because it's beautiful, because it's famous, because it's powerful. How did you get away? I ran into alcohol and I was an alcoholic, a teenage alcoholic. She was also, at times, suicidal. The thing that really saved me as a human being, my husband. Maria defied her mother and married set designer William Riva in 1947, while Dietrich was off in Europe, continuing her tireless morale building for the wartime troops. With personal attention, of course, to General Patton and General Gavin, to name but a few. Even in her 50s, she continued to collect men and women, her reports ever more lurid and graphic. She saw my husband and she pulled out of her handbag one pair of pink panties and waved it under his nose and said, Oh, smell, it's the President of the United States. Let's say this was the 1960s. Mm-hmm. Oh, please don't hesitate to stare. I'm quite accustomed to it. 
By this time, Riva, a beauty in her own right, had been a popular star on television, but gradually become pulled back into her mother's drama. Dietrich enlisted Riva to help her create a one-woman show. Sell-out crowds came to see Dietrich in sequin dresses that weighed 14 pounds, with a special harness to recreate the famous figure. Wigs that concealed how she pulled back the skin on her face and pinned it, oblivious to the pain. I get no kick from champagne, the alcohol doesn't thrill me at all. She kept it up until 1975, when her legs were so badly swollen from blocked arteries that she could barely walk. She did not know anything else but work, duty to the legend. We describe off stage a table that had the Nembutal, Secondal, mm -hmm. Scotch. I hid her alcoholism for 10 years, and we did it very well. Desperate for the money, Dietrich made one more movie, just a gigolo. She was 77 and drunk. When the end comes, I know, it's say just a gigolo. After that, Dietrich never showed her face again. She stayed in this Paris apartment for 13 years, not sick, drinking, taking pills, still flirting on the telephone, inventing wicked little fantasies, even for her funeral. All the men who walked into the church and women uh, who had slept with her would get a red carnation, and all the people who said they had slept with her but hadn't slept with her would get the white carnation, you see. And I once said to her, well, how about having the whole 82nd Airborne Division, you know, make a jump over the Madeleine wearing their carnations, you see, with General Gavin leading the way with his carnation. And she said, oh, that's wonderful. But Riva says her mother also had a real and cruel plan. In the final years, Dietrich, still sharp mentally, refused to wash her hair or her body, using anything nearby as a bedpan, smelling Riva writes of booze and decay and writing lies in her diary that her daughter never came to see her, knowing that legends need drama right to the end. You theorize that maybe she wanted to die this squalid way. She was setting up this magnificent scene of dejection, desertion, this old woman, this beautiful woman who had given her life to her daughter who had always done only everything for her daughter, uh, who had been left to starve in her own dirt, bedridden, all alone. What do you think people will say about this book? Oh, I think some people are going to draw and quarter me. Why do you have to tell us these things? I think those of us who live with great fame have to say that it is a trip of survival and that a lot of us don't make it. Do you worry about the mommy dearest of it all? This is the most intimate detail oh, I ever knew I was going to write to this book. You know. With this kind of detail? Oh, yeah. Let me ask you a question. You've read my book. Do you still like Dietrich? I read that her last word was your name. Well, she probably didn't say it as you would like to imagine that she said it. She probably said it, Maria. Marlena Dietrich died last May. Her public lined up to mourn her, including a daughter who wept. And as she wrote in her book, buried her mother in Berlin, back where the life and the legend began. I only whisper, be good to her. She needs you to be good to her. And I cry for all the lost love so unretrievable. Dietrich, in the end, did create a final monument to her legend. And in the coming weeks, we are going to take you into the vault and look at what Sotheby's thinks may be one of the most dazzling collections ever. Because throughout her life, she kept and had cataloged everything from photographs to lingerie to all those fabulous costumes.